Hey, welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. This is Diane Gibbs. I'm your host, and today is a rapid recharge. I'm going to recap WMC Fest. Look, I got my shirt on, but it's cold in here in South Alabama. And we're going to recap um, WMC Fest and say hey to all the people who showed up here today. And I'm going to show you this, um, some things that I saw and talk about some people that I met, which I was really excited to meet a bunch of people. And I was trying to find um, on Instagram, my new friend, Carly. And me and Will were just talking about, talking about it. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen really quick. And look at these cute little characters. So this is, must be um, in process, but you've got to watch this one. All right, ready? Look at its little butt, I don't even know, like flab above love handles, sort of. I just think he's so cute. And then there's this one, butt wrinkle. That's her puppy. All right. I'm, that one was really funny. I love the, uh, I love that picture. What is your dog's name, Carly? And then I read butt wrinkle. I'm sure that's not her name. Okay. Um, there was, wait, let me, I got to go back. This one I thought was great. Like she even had these little characters and then were, was shooting them, which I thought was just terrific. And, you know, it's like it was really a really nice small group that um, intimate where you actually sometimes at other conferences I feel really busy. And, and I think they're made out of like sculpty clay. Um, you'll have to let us know there's some more that are just adorable. Like, look at this guy. I mean, really, really cute. Carly, I'm just lifting you up, girl. But there are just so many super cute ones that, anyway, you guys will have to check her out. Republic of Cute. But I also got to meet Lisa Lorick. If you're, let's see if I can pull her up. There we go. And she was a speaker, and she made this awesome post and and she just was really so driven and i thought she just rocked it and then i um got to meet her uh girl that works at her company also emily and she was this uh really neat jewelry artist you know when you do a lot of things look there's your thing carly the republic of cute um and i can't see when you guys are like questioning me when i do this so i'm sorry she said sculpts them in clay and cast them in resin. Oh, thank you, Will. And then Jed said she mentioned it was re resin. And then Will and anyway. So, but it got to meet a ton of people. And I thought what I would do is kind of go over, back over my talk with you. And so I will stop my screen share real quick. And then I'm going to share it again. And so... Let me just kind of walk you through, if you're new to the platform, there is, at the bottom, it says chat, and then there's a chat box that comes up, and you can either pop it out, or it can just be hung on to the window, window. and this is the beauty of it being live, that we can actually see each other, or I can see that you're there, and it's nice that you get to see me or whatever I'm sharing on screen, and usually there's two people, and you're listening to me ask some questions and then somebody else answer them. But the chat is where most of the comments from everybody's coming in. And I believe it's at the bottom, right guys? And then you click chat and then the thing pops up to the right. Okay. Jed says yes. And then, and I got to meet Jed. I hadn't met Jed before. He's New Jersey, right? Jed. And then you do, he loves cars, taking pictures of cars. Yes. Yes. Okay. So then, um, um, so yeah, the, Zoom is pretty new for most people. So, but I do like it because it does have the live ability. All right. So let me pull these out real quick. So Allison, you can tell us where y'all are from or you, you are from that. And Carol Ann, she was one of my students. She's from, she lives in Washington state now. CJ is one of my people and Ford, one of my people, but she's, uh, in, we went to the same grad school. She's in Virginia. CJ is one of mine. He's in Mobile. Um, Kim, you're here. This is Kim's poster right there. Um, 
Maria, Mara, Nancy. I think that's my Nancy, one of my Nancy Scott Hofford. Um, he does a ton of really cool little drawings and then fills them in things. So you guys should find Paige Garland. She's also here. She's one of mine. Um, I feel like you all are my people though, right? Um, hopefully you're not getting offended if I, but if I say mine, like probably I taught you as a student or anyway, who cares what? I just want to make sure I'm recording. Okay. So I'm going to, okay. So doc sent his link and it's etsy.me just for anybody who's listening on iTunes to W O C as in cat T is in Tom. Y is in you. What is that last letter L and Jason Frost homes here? Yes. An L, but it's lowercase. Does it really matter? I don't know. It's two, a little case W O and then C T Y is uppercase and then a lowercase L. Anyway, so Doc has awesome, I mean, really amazing um, work for sure. It, yeah, that's okay. It's a bitly links fine. It would have been super long otherwise. All right, so I'm going to show you my beavers thing that I did, if that's okay. It'll be repeat for some of you people. <laughs> Sorry, you know what I mean. Jed said, best line ever. Okay, all right, I'm going to share my screen. And I don't know how. All right, now maybe you see what I see. And I'm hoping maybe if I do this, I don't know if it'll let me. There it goes. Can you guys see that? Can you see the chat still? Over on the side? Is it on your screen? Okay. Okay. All right, can you see this participants thing too? Not your chat, I see my chat. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna move this over. So I'm gonna, uh, these are my, yeah, these are the artsy beavers. Um, so this is beavers in the new front porch and you're probably thinking, what the heck does this have to do with design? Well, I'm also gonna talk to you about, oh, your window, sharing is pause, bring your, Shared window to the front. I don't know how to do that. Resume share. Hmm. Stop share. I don't know. Hang on. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulty. Okay, now. Now you can see, I think. So, uh, man, I really threw, flew through some things. So I also want to talk how I think air conditioning ruined how we build communities. And Will told me afterwards that he said he wrote a paper on this. And I don't know if it was in high school or if it was in college, but I thought that was pretty interesting that we both were on the same page here. So how a designer is like a beaver. Well, we both are hardworking. We have to work together to build things. We don't usually work in a vacuum very much. Um, we make the world better through our work. And outside of our element, we struggle, but we never give up. Because, you know, beavers kind of have these tiny little arms and they're really made for water. They can swim really fast and dive and they're, they can hold their breath a long time. But outside, they, have to, they still have to get the trees and stuff from the outside, um, from the land. So, but they don't let that give them, uh, they don't let it get them down. They just keep at it. So beavers create ecosystems for other animals. And so because of what the beavers create for themselves, it actually provides for a ton of different kinds of animals. Um, and so I have some here, which are like bunnies and deer and moose and blue heron was one of them, raccoons, things like that. Fish, obviously. Um, so you're going to see that I think we're better than rodents, better than, for sure. They also, in the winter, provide, there are frogs and mice that live in their dens. They call them the lodge. They're, they live in that lodge with the beavers. So the beavers build it and then the other people come and they let them stay. They don't run them out, which I think is really kind of unique for species. Um, they, I'm going to share a few more things. But so there was this, there's this documentary and it's called Leave It to Beavers. And it talks about uh, Michelle LeClaire is a 
he's over the roads that are in this Gatineau Park, or he's one of the people that manages the road systems. And there are culverts, which uh, is like a big pipe underneath a road. And the beavers were building dams right at the culvert. And so what would happen is the water wouldn't go through the, the, the big pipe. It would go over the road and then wash the road away, and which completely cost a ton of money. This is a national park, and it was, excuse me, 140 acres. So what he um, figured out was that really they, um, they would take the um, dams apart every, every day, and then the beavers would build them back at night. Every day, take them down. Every night, they'd build them back. And it was so constant that it didn't matter how many times the beavers were going to keep going. The beavers never gave up. And I feel like we have to do this as well, right? We have to be this person that never gives up because sometimes we're the only person building our own thing. So, but what it was, was he had this idea that they were hearing the call the call of the the running water and when they heard the call they had they were like um so uh driven to stop the stop that water rushing sort of sound so he had this idea he was like i'm going to test my theory he got a little boom box and he stuck it out there with a cd of like running water and he just put it on loop put it out there one night the next morning it was covered it, a dam was over it. Now, I don't know if it, you know, the water actually, the music water stopped. But he figured out if he could just change where the water was. And he ended up putting like spikes, 15, like um, field fence poles, kind of is what it looked like, so that the water would hit it. And he had that and then this big um, pipe was in front so that, if the beaver, the beavers would build the dam in front of that, instead, which was like 15 feet in front of the culverts. And it, it was great because beavers are amazing engineers and they get the water to go where they want it to go, which was pretty amazing. I also think we hear the call. We create ecosystems, which we call economy, right? It's an economy for different businesses. If they didn't have us, their businesses might not take off because we help them look real, right? So one beaver, a uh, beaver can be anywhere from like 20 pounds to like 65 pounds, but actually beavers never stop growing physically. But one beaver can fell a tree that's 12 inches in diameter. So that's just a little bit bigger, right? An inch bigger than, than this. I don't think you can see me a little bit, but they can fell a tree and take some half a night, one beaver to do this. Now then they have to break it up. And I feel like, um, this is kind of like a, any project that we have. We have to maybe take a big chunk in the beginning and then we have to break it into small pieces. And a lot of times we don't just do it all ourselves, right? So because they're able, because they work together, they build better dams and they actually mentor their young. They, they put rocks on them. I don't think they put that big rock on there. I think it was probably there, but they do all this mastery and then they end up, They'd go to the bottom and they dredge and they bring up with their little T-Rex arms and pack the dirt um, and the sludge kind of from the bottom. And the deeper their ponds, the longer lasting. They actually, in um, I think I talk about this in a minute, but in 2002, um, there was a terrible drought in um, in like the western United States. I can't remember if it was Montana or Colorado or something, but it was what happened was all these ecosystems kind of went down. They, um, the, a lot of the animals died because there wasn't any water. There was, and beavers are great at water storage. That's what this, this does. And they'll dig deeper and so that the water is able to be stored longer. Well, wherever there were beavers, there was life. And I thought that was amazing. So back to the story here. So I read this book, Drive, by Daniel Peake, which I actually love, love this book. I don't know if anybody has read this. Nobody's talking now over there. Okay. Um, Jason says there's the, the, I think the mice and the frogs are squatters, and sort of, I guess, but they were okay. Um, but Angela Lee Duckworth, there's a TED Talk about this if you want to learn more about this study, actually. And I'll link it in the, in the notes. Um, this is a great book. So 
the this is just one part you know he mentions a study and it was about West Point cadets that's supposed to be a West Point cadet so what happens was they wanted to see what kids would be retained um, we call it retention right the the ones that stay throughout the whole course of a of a career the ones that never give up kind of the ones that even though they're battling something they don't give up well, it could be, she did the study with, um, oh, okay. Um, I was just reading the chat again. <laughs> Doc says he was enthralled in my story. <clears throat> so thanks, Doc. I appreciate the confidence or the uh, encouragement, I guess. Um, so the West Point cadets, they go like three weeks, four weeks early, I believe, and they have to go through boot camp. And some kids never even make it to, to going to the first day of school. So then it's four years of, you know, military training plus whatever you are studying. And then you're, you're in the military and you're whatever they learn at West Point. But they wanted to see if it was the kids that were academically the strongest that, you know, had the highest IQs or it was the ones that were physically strongest that, you know, were the ones that withstood and would be the ones four years later that would graduate and you know at West Point you actually have to have someone writing you a letter to get you in so this is like a governor or a senator has to you know there are a lot of hoops you have to jump through it's not just like a regular college so what they found out that it wasn't the kids that were most academically um, successful it wasn't the kids that were physically successful it was the kids who had failed more often it was the ones that had struggled and because they struggled they were stronger so they had they called these kids the ones with grit this is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals so I love this I definitely am a gritty kid I think and one thing that these um, cadets found or that they the study people psychologists found was that these cadets who had grit knew that failure wasn't forever sometimes if you've always been academically strong and then you aren't as academically strong you start seeing that as a representative of you and you thought that um, it hits in on who your core image is of yourself but if you always haven't been super strong then this isn't something you know that is a forever you. It is just something that is, you weren't good at this one thing and that you can get better. And I thought that was really amazing. And I think that that's like that one tree that's not already pulled down is that it's just one tree, right? So a beaver has a reputation to uphold. And I think designers do too, right? They're hardworking and busy as a beaver and I feel like there's not a lot of designers that are just sitting around doing nothing and if they are they're probably not maybe the um, the ones that are watching the show or the ones that read books or the ones that are um, not trying to better themselves so again that struggle makes us stronger and so the ponds that beavers create provide for others and think about our ponds see how this this is like a raccoon who owns a bar because you know raccoons are like night people I thought that was clever or funny but clearly nobody else is laughing it's just me okay so um, but I thought this was neat because we do really think think about what if there was a coffee shop or a bar or a, a brand if they didn't have somebody a designer to help them with it nobody's going to take them seriously right because it doesn't look real so we that we this is the pond we create and it provides for others and even if you're not I like always have that um, wanting to be work for Coca-Cola or wanting to work for some big company. But really, I have a client who taught me something recently. Now, I've never had a really big client, but I have a lot of little clients who really provide for a lot of other people. And I think if I can make their business grow and if they've had me for 10 years, that's a huge investment. And that means that I'm doing something right because they've continued to grow for nine years. Right. So I don't think it always has to be these this goal to uh, have these huge names because a huge name client. This is what my client taught me recently. He's like, well, I go for the mom and pop shops. 
because I know if I make good relationships, then they will be with me for a very long time. And if I hit up the one distributor, as soon as the distributor gets a cheaper version, then they're going to let me go. And so if I put all my eggs in this big distributor, the Coca-Cola's or whatever, then when I lose that client, then my business is gone. And so I really liked that. I really, uh, I've lived like that for a long time. And now I'm a little bit more happy about that instead of, I mean, I still probably would like a something that you people have seen, but I also am really happy that my clients are, are with me for a long period of time and that I'm helping them grow. And I think that's really, we shouldn't discount that. So here's some other things that are great about beavers. Beavers warn others about potential threats and danger. They actually slap their tail on the water. So say a bear or a wolf came around the pond and they are going to slap their tail. They're going to, from that, the fish are able to be warned. The turtles, the frogs, rabbits, they're all able, they warn everybody. And we do this, we warn people, but we also, hey, here's this deal on design cuts or here's this thing on creative market or whatever, right? Thanks, Kim. I love you. All right, so beavers and designers never stop growing. Think about it. If we stop growing mentally, then we are not in our industry anymore. We absolutely will be out. So if you stop growing, whether it's technical skills or um, then you're just not interested in keeping up with um, whatever, right? You're with whatever is current. We have to keep up. Well, beavers actually physically never stop growing. So you could have, now I don't know how, I didn't do really good research clearly. I don't know how old beavers really can get, but they physically never stop growing. And the biggest I could see in my children's book research was like, um, 65 pounds or something like that. So again, where there are beavers and designers, I think there's life. So this is just another pond. And this is when I told you about the 2002 drought. Cause again, they're keeping floods, droughts, they're helping. <laughs> and Steph says she's all, all, um, all stuffs. So I think our secret is community, just kind of like the beavers. And I think we need to be each other's champions and each other's cheerleaders instead of um, cutting people down, especially in a, a online, things like that. So I think beavers, I know beavers are the keystone species, and I believe that designers are. And there's my, at the bottom, June 29th, 2017, this is a, I did quote this out. And did you see that nice hanging punctuation over there? Can you see my mouse? And no one. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. So the keystone species is an organism that helps define an entire ecosystem. Without its keystone species, the ecosystem would be dramatically different or cease to exist altogether. The ecosystem would be forced to radically change, allowing change, allowing new and possibly invasive species to populate the habitat. I can just think of this as, um, you know, terrible designers all the good designers are gone and then your aunt's whatever you know lawn care worker starts um helping with the design so that's taking over invasive species or something oh good hey carly um so i think we're made for community and just so you know this back here is aspen tree which is the favorite one of the favorite things of a beaver so everything is sort of tied together. And then this is just paper. But it sort of looked like the inside of a tree. So go with me on it. So we're made for community and we're made um, to support each other. So before the 1950s, here's where the air conditioning comes in. Before the 1950s, this is a photo by Dorothea Lang. And it's courtesy of the Library of Congress. Um, we would congregate and we would converse and we would see what was going on by hanging out on the front porches. Now in the South where I am, people would hang out on the front porches because it was so hot. You would have some through air, but really it was, hot. it was so hot inside. At the end of the day, you would hang out on the porches and people would walk by or drive by. You would know who was, what 
was going on. So porches were really important. And in the 1950s, air conditioning became more prevalent, more affordable, and we went inside. So we ended up taking this porch mentality away, and we stopped knowing necessarily what was going on with everyone. Excuse me, man, I got the burps. Um, so this is what a porch maybe looks like today. It is really aesthetically pleasing. It is not necessarily used. It is not something that people your neighbors are going to come up because there's been so much time, 50 years of when we don't really use our porches. We really use our porches for this, right? Boxes, delivery, Amazon, whatever. But this I think is the new front porch. Facebook came into existence in 2004, YouTube 2005, Twitter 2006, Dribble 2009, 2000, hmm. I should have got my notes. Hang on. Well, I can't find them. Um, I have them in my bag somewhere. Clearly, I didn't pull them out. I think it was 2010, and then Instagram was 2011. No, I'm not only drinking one a day now, um, Jason. So on these platforms, we are sharing, and hopefully we are consuming. Hopefully you're not just consuming, and you're, or you're not just sharing. Um, but the thing is, is that you don't have to always be perfect. I think Bob Ewing is a great example. There's tons of other examples, but I think of Bob from the get go of him sharing in, I think it was September of 2013 or 2012. And then him just sharing his daily progress. And if you need some inspiration or to see how far somebody's come, I really do think that it's good for you to leave your old stuff up so that you can inspire somebody else as well because we all get better and I think we need to be there for each other as we are perfecting our craft and that's when we don't need to cut people down we need to be their cheerleader their champion so in 2001 um, I there was a job opening at my alma mater and at Auburn University and I was so excited and I applied and I so you would usually have the applications due sometime in 2000 January 2012 and then I would hopefully hear back sometime you know in March or April well nothing I had crickets you know it was me and the beavers and so I was like wow so I finally called and I said hey I was just wondering if you filled the position sometimes positions get canceled they didn't have money so the search had to be closed off but um, nothing. They actually had filled the position. They didn't even send an email or a letter, nothing, thanks for applying, whatever. So I was like, man, what was wrong with me? And I really thought, wow, what did I do as an undergrad? What kind of impression did I make that I that they wouldn't even, you know, I don't know, call me back. At some point, you know, I, it could have been that I was an associate professor. I'd already been teaching for nine years and maybe that was just too much time. They wanted somebody, um, maybe they wanted somebody who was younger or whatever. I'm fresh out of school, so it would be cheaper. Um, who knows? It, it may have been that I was just too talkative as a, uh, or my work wasn't very good or I didn't have the kind of exposure that they wanted. And so instead of just blaming Auburn, I said, okay, what can I do? How can, what can I do that can make me better? And I just still love Auburn. I still love my professors. I, um, I appreciate it. And I, I took, and it could be that they didn't, they don't hire um, alumni. I have no idea. Um, I never got any feedback, but I also think that's okay. So what could I do to make me better? And so I decided to, no, no, wrong one, Jed. Not Roll Tide, War Eagle. That's what Amy said. Um, all right, so um, I knew I needed community, and I didn't need just community because I had community through my church, um, and I had friends, but I needed design community. And what I, was happening was in my town, there was no um, – um, is that the next slide? Yes. So I was teaching. I was running a business, so I started my business in 2002 
Little Bird Communications. Don't even bother looking. I don't have a website up. Um, the Dan Marino and I are both trying to um, uh, get our website up. And I will, hopefully, in September. But um, I was running my business, so I'm, I didn't have a lot of time. I have a husband and then many pets. And then there were no local groups, no creative mornings, no AIGA. And I really didn't have a lot of time. So there was this one local group and they were like, they met downtown. Well, I live way almost in Mississippi. And so it would have taken me like an hour and a half to get downtown after working. And it just would have been too late. I just didn't have a lot of time. So I decided that I was, I found this thing called Spreecast and it was an online, um, it's not there anymore, but it was an online uh, uh, face kind of like Skype, but you could join in the conversations, any conversations that were going on and you could create your own video. You could interact even if you didn't want to be on camera. And I started it. That was, I found it in May and I started it in June. I actually did one. The first one is like May 27th. Um, but I just did it with my sister. So I didn't really feel like that counted. So, um, if you look up ready kilowatt, and I think Amy might have pulled up something like this in the um, uh, in the past. But ready, my dad worked for Georgia Power, and so I really had this um, old kind of. I wanted the plug, and Ready Kilowatt was kind of this retro lightning bolt guy, and and I wanted something sort of in that field. I know I didn't necessarily get that, but the big plug and then the little plug. So all my robots usually have one bigger eye. And then instead, if you notice the mouth really would have been a frowny mouth if you look at your any outlet. Um, but I didn't like that. So I wanted it to be a happy mouth. So yeah, I agree, Carly. Um, so this is kind of what it looked like. There was the interactive at the bottom, which was really cool. You could see how many people were there. And you could see um, who was there and it would bring their picture. And then you could also share images, which um, actually, I know you can't, well, you can a little bit. The dog behind me was made by Nikki and she's a printmaker and she would do some amazing stuff. So this is on wood and then she would draw on it as well. And this is her daughter giving herself um, a tattoo. Yeah, um, that was where Joseph met me in the beginning was on Spreecast and it was really fun. It was really cool. Um, ended up, it went out of business and I went on to do other things and on a bit, I think this is the fourth platform I've been on, but I, the kinds of people I would have on would be, I had attorneys, uh, Mitch Jackson was on from, uh, um, Orange County, California. Um, I've had the type fight guys. I've had Mike Jones here. I've had artists like Doc on. I've had industry leaders who are doing something um, different. It, you know, really what what get, what makes you a good candidate for design recharge is somebody who's doing something interesting, who's humble, who um, has something to share that I feel like would help an entrepreneur or a um, a design entrepreneur or a freelancer who's trying to kind of do something on the side. Um, and then if you have like a product or you're doing a neat project, I would definitely have you, have you on. And I know there were some other things, but I can, I can't find my notes. So there were other good things, but pretty much what I was doing was I was connecting me. I'm really the cord that connects the internet, like the, the, wall the outlet with the electricity with the light and the light is the person that comes on the show and they have this neat thing that they're on it sharing and so this was the first time i had met bob and drew so bob ewing um right here and drew hill and then this is jenny lee she works for dave ramsey i think she's a web designer but she's also a letterer so i was like surrounded by all these letters there's jason karn who i was sitting right here and jason's right there um, these two guys were from Boston. I can't remember what their names are, but maybe Bob or Drew or Ginny or Jason remembers. Um, anyway, this was in Derek Castle's workshop. There's Derek. There's Lenny. Um, and lots of other people. There's Anne. She's here. I don't know if she's still here, but there she is. So we were at this. I had already met Jason. I had had him on the show before. 
See what it used to look like? Boring, right? Isn't this so much better behind me? So Jason was on the show, but then we got to meet in person then uh, at that. Uh, that was the first time I think we met Jason. And then this was a couple years later. That's what I gave him for his um, wedding present was a tick to, ticket to Creative South. And he put in a Facebook message sometime after and he said, I think I'm going to have to leave the industry and go back to construction. And I was like, oh my goodness. And it really triggered something in me. It was a very emotive because I felt like I've heard this before. I don't want people to leave just because it gets hard. And I knew it had been hard, but Jason had worked for Harley Davidson. He had done a ton of great stuff. But one of the key things, which I've heard again and again, you get really busy and you stop promoting. You stop sharing your work, um, either because you don't have time to do a side project or self-initiated project, and then you end up not having enough work um, in the future to sustain yourself. And so it, it's something. So Jason ended up, um, he, it, he has a job in Kentucky, and so he got a job job. I mean, a job in design, though, right? He's a designer. But so I said, hey, I want to connect you with my friend Dustin. And so Dustin and Jason met at Creative South a few years ago. Maybe it was 2016. And they decided to start selling Lettering Library. So Lettering Library is something Jason has. He has these books that are over 75 years old that he scans. Some are really old, tight books. So you get kind of this full catalog. And these were books that he would spend maybe $400 on one book. He would scan every page and you would get this, this set and the whole thing. And they still are selling it just so you know, you can still get it at retro supply. Um, anyway, so they teamed up and then Jason, um, they decided on the cut and then, uh, Dustin sent it out to his list. Well, they made about $30,000 in a week and they shared this, in person. So I feel like it's okay that I share that. Hopefully that's okay. Anyway, so I realized that some of my superpowers were this connecting, but I really didn't know how to use it. I didn't really know if it was really valuable. Um, and then I think with more conversations with Dustin, um, he's been a great cheerleader for me that it really was something that was valuable. But I still think a lot of times my superpowers are mostly soft skills. I am working on my illustrations though, people. But I also believe that everybody has, um, thank you, Maria shared it. So it's retrosupply.co slash products slash lettering hyphen library hyphen mega hyphen bundle, if anybody, um, and Doc says it's great. And it is great. So everybody has these God-given natural talents. And boogers. Okay. Okay. So my superpowers are having a good memory, reading people's body language, listening. I think I'm, I'm a pretty good listener. My husband might think something else. And I also think it's, um, I'm pretty good about relating to others using analogies. So I relate to my students, but I also relate to my clients so that they really can understand. Thanks, Jen. He says I'm a good listener. So I think here's an, an example of an analogy superpower. So I think good type is like a good bra when it's working, when it's doing its job, you don't even notice it. <laughs> so this is another one that's about reading faces. A friend of mine from college, and I didn't really get permission to use these pictures. So, um, but anyway, she has three daughters. And so she was like, Oh my gosh, first day of school. Only one of them is a real smile. Let me go ahead and zoom in. Anybody want to guess one, two or three. And if you were there this weekend, don't, don't guess. So you think the real smile is number one, two people. One person says number three, number three. It is, it is number three. Brian says number one. So a lot of few people said number one or number three. It's clear that number two is not a real smile. That girl is not faking. I mean, she is faking it all. It is. That was my also choice. It was between one or between three. But if you cover over, like if you put your hand over their um, their nose and mouth, you can really tell from their eyes that number three was really excited about going. 
So another superpower is connecting with people and also connecting people. I think those are actually maybe two different things. Um, but I really try to make sure that I'm not just spouting out what's important to me. I also really want to listen what's important to other people. Um, Jed is on fire. Oh, gotcha. All right. But I was guilty, and I still am guilty of comparing myself to people who had skills I was aspiring to possess. Like, I would love to draw like Doc. If you go and look, and it's Redicus, R-E-E-D-I-C-U-S, I believe. <laughs> um, I thought you were saying this conference call, Jed. Uh, um, so it was like, okay, you could go if you don't want to hang out. But um, <laughs> anyway... So Doc is amazing, and I would love to be like Doc. I don't necessarily want to draw exactly like him, but the layering, I think, is so amazing. So, But I am not drawing like that yet. I am drawing my little beavers, but I am improving. I do see that I've improved in a year, even though I haven't practiced very much in this past year because I was in that admin position, which I am not anymore. Um, so... Um, all right. So my superpowers are mostly, ugh, mostly soft skills. So I was like, Oh my goodness. Well, what am I going to do with that? And I really have struggled with this. This has been kind of a, um, a touchy point for me and I really don't know how to use it. But then I, again, Dustin's a great cheerleader for me. And he said, I think you could use your connecting. And so with the connecting, well, let me tell you about this first. So I had this client who is a face reader and she didn't, it didn't come natural to her. Just kind of like, um, the, you know, if you guess number one, I mean, it was quick people. So, you know, but I'm pretty good at reading people's faces or body language. And I think it just comes from years of feeling out of place probably and being able to judge when I really was or when I fit in. But I really do kind of come out and say, Hey, um, are you mad at me or did I hurt your feelings even when maybe I didn't, but I still am getting something that vibe. So I've known now to kind of trust asking when I get the vibe, I just try to ask if I feel like I've done something or maybe I don't know what I've done. Um, but anyway, so I'm, she said that if you, she said, did you, did things come easy to you? And I was like, no, never. Like they didn't come easy as a kid. They didn't come easy at all. And she said, I can tell because the lines in your forehead, forehead are pretty deep. And she said, that's an uh, uh, example. That's a characteristic of somebody who struggled um, but didn't give up, right? That's the, that's the kid with grit. See, my glasses are purple. They're little kids' glasses. You can actually see that there. Um, so remember, you know, having grit is a commitment to a long-term and perseverance to a long-term goal. And I, five years ago, I made a commitment. So with the whole thing at Auburn, I made a commitment. I had heard Srini Rao, um, and I can't remember what his podcast was at that point. I think it's the Accidental Creative now. But he had said, yeah, give it five years. Do the podcast for five years. Do whatever it is you're going to do, do it for five years. Because it's a marathon, not a um, sprint. And that really stuck with me. And I'm like... Man, I have a guitar, and I think I can play one song. I have picked up a lot of things over the years, but it hasn't really stuck. And so when I heard that, I was like, okay, I'm going to really do this. This is something that helps me. It never counted for me. My old boss never really counted it as um, research, which as a designer professor, you have to do research. So what I have to do is I have to have clients, and I have to win awards to be able to move up or get promoted or things like that. Um, and get tenure, um, which I have, thankfully. Um, but anyway, so I think that this was something really, I had an aunt one time ask me, she's like, well, who's making you do this? And I was like, me? I am. Like, what? How weird is that? Is that really that weird that we don't make commitments to ourselves, you know? And I felt five years it is. That's a long time. But, and as Jason knows, it's, it's, um, it can be rough. There can be like, at episode 30, you're halfway through a year and you're like, man, can I do this every week? It can be really, um, there's got to be something in it that I'm getting. And there was. To me, it wasn't just that it was counting on the end of my 
into my school report that it was something that I got every week. I learned, I have learned so much from these people that I've interviewed. And I actually now I'm friends with many of these people. Um, <laughs> growling is the word you're looking for, he says. So I believe it's really important that we know people inside our design industry and then outside of our industry. So we need to know business leaders like um, Dustin. Dustin would be a business leader, but he's still somebody within our industry. But then we also need to know other people who may need somebody. So I'm not a hand letterer. And if I need hand lettering, I might go to Jason Karn, or I might go to Scotty Russell, or I might go to Bob Ewing, or Jenny Lee, or Shauna Panchezen. Um, I might go to one of them because they are more the expert on what one of my clients needs. So it's good that we know people that are um, not just exactly that do the exact same thing as us. If you're a web designer, you need to know more than just people who are doing web design so that you can give them work and then they in turn can give you work. Can you see the circles now? You guys see this? Um, that you couldn't see them on Saturday. So again, that overlap The see, remember I told you the beavers provided for frogs and mice and see there they are providing for frogs and mice. Um, but it's good to know people who aren't doing um, the same thing so that you can provide services or also connect them with people who, who can. Okay. Um, okay. Another call I've heard is to help people get matched up. And so this is where I'm using those soft skills to actually make a little bit of extra cash. And what I... Um, have done is I started this recruiting creatives and I do have that pointing to the correct um, URL, which is still on recharging you slash recruiting hyphen creatives, but it'll recruiting creatives takes you there. Um, yeah, I was excited, Brian, that I got that um, URL. Anyway, pretty much I take budding designers, people who have recently graduated and I pair them up with people who are kind of like me who work alone, but we're kind of at that, um, I'm getting a little too big for my britches that I can't do everything and get enough sleep and exercise and things like that. So I need a little bit more balance and I need somebody who I can afford, right? I don't need to pay somebody who's at my same level to do some of these things. I need somebody who can help me get out from under, but help my business to grow. And so I'm looking for entrepreneurs and I've talked to you guys about this and it's in the newsletter, but this is what I've been kind of focused on and it really launches September 1st. But what I'm doing right now is I'm building up these people. So um, I'm meeting with a bunch of budding designers that I've gotten, they've come recommended to me or these are people that are alumni that I know super well. Um, but I've, reached out to some other of my design professor friends and have asked them to send me some people. These are mostly remote jobs. Now, granted, they would move if you really want them to work with you, but like TJ Harley, who was on a few weeks ago, he works in his house. He didn't really care for Lauren to come to his house and work. He was fine sending her stuff and then working. But think about it. As we're together working, we work really closely. We need trust but we also need to know that you have a good eye, that you can match somebody else's skills, um, skill level, uh, meaning that you might not have their full skills, but you could kind of match the look that they've created. So really you're becoming the art director and then somebody else is doing some of the production or some of the design work. So I've connected Ian Barnard and um, Megan, uh, girl I know. I've connected people who actually do work in the same um, city and in the same um, location. So uh, my best friend Tara, she hired um, Jessica. And then when Jessica left, she hired Louise. So Louise moved from Alabama out to Denver and works. they work together. Um, then there's also uh, Dustin and Suzanne. I started Dustin and Katie started first. So those are all things that were, um, those are doable, right? So for me, those are things are doable. Now I've gotten some more people on board and I'm continuing to grow that kind of list of budding designers. 
and it could be zero hours a week to 10 hours. It could be, and you got, you get to work with them on what, what rate you want, but it's a rate that's, so I haven't really matched mid-level or upper level designers with someone. That's not really where I'm focused on right now. So I'm really focusing on budding designers. And I love this quote. It says, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. And it's by Picasso. So I thought that was, I really felt, feel like this is more of what I'm really supposed to be doing. I do think I'm supposed to be a teacher. I don't feel released from that. Um, but I also think there's tons of excuses. I could say with about being an illustrator that I am too old to become an illustrator. I'm too old to start something new or I'm too old to learn web design or too old for whatever. But would anybody here tell me that I was too old to become an illustrator? And I think, thank you, Brian White said no, never. So what are your excuses? So what is holding you back? Because I think those excuses are what for so long held me back. And I used to just say, well, I'm not an illustrator. Instead of, even though I really wanted to be, I never put in the time and the effort to become that. And it's not like, oh, man, I wish it was like this at the gym. You could just pay your money and get skinny and you never have to go, right? Like that would be awesome. I would love to just own the tools and be an illustrator, but it takes exactly what Maria said. It takes time and energy. And so you have to be committed to it. This is not something that, is going to happen unless you commit time to it. And then how much, so I teach, you know, so I've asked my seniors, I said, what are you going to give up this year so that you can get a job when you get out? And, you know, sometimes they don't have anything to give up. They're like, I don't know what else I'm going to squeeze out. And really, I think it's time. It's sleep in that final year. It's sleep maybe now. I mean, uh, Doc has three kids, right, Doc? And nothing. Anyway, Brian has three kids. And I know you give up sleep, but you still paint. You do printmaking. You do web design. You do logos. These are all these things that you do. And I think you do give up something. So it may be that you give up time after dinner. And you do, oh, Maria has five. So she has... <laughs> She hasn't slept in years, people. Um, he gives up TV. But I do think what, really, it's looking really seriously about what those excuses are. And so I didn't want that obstacle to define me and who I was. And you know what? We're not competing against each other. I think that some designers, there's where that competition comes in and they don't want to help somebody else because they're, they might take their same client. And I really don't think that we're really competing against each other. I think we would never say that the, there's not enough plumbers to go around or not enough air conditioning people to go around. Because when your air conditioning breaks, I promise you, it is hard to get them there within 24 hours. Because they're always busy. Because there's not enough people. There's not this explosion of, um, of designers or explosion of air conditioning service people or explosion of plumbers. We, there's a good enough amount for us, there's enough work for us all to have work. So, yeah. All right. So, Doc has four. Shane Helm has five. Um, Anne says, I seem to have less excuses when I was in college with a full time job and kids. And it does seem like other things come in. And I think some of the, sometimes for me, it has to do with, I don't see any results and I think we're in this results driven society and that's why you got to think about that five year plan and you can't get caught up and it's really hard. I mean, I'm talking to myself here. You can't get caught up in what you don't have and who's not following you. It's just, you have to keep making good work. Kim says she has needs a five year plan. So Kim and I are kind of accountability partners and we meet once every two weeks and Next next time we meet, we met yesterday, and next time we meet, we're going to have some goals, and then we're going to have some, oh, poo. What else are we going to have? I wrote it down in my sketchbook, but maybe she can write it down. Thank you, Maria. She says she loves my beaver drawings. You're definitely an illustrator. Do you think comparison and competition doesn't let us see the writing on the wall for what it is? You know what? I think comparison, you have to have some comparison. I think that's how, how you get 
better. So if I look at this and think, oh yeah, this is great. Like, no, the guy in the back, his arm looks funny. It looks like it doesn't bend correctly. And the tail maybe of the first beaver should have been lower. So it doesn't look like that guy has this big bouffant, right? Yeah. Cartley says he's flexible, but I, I really do think that comparison is key. I think we need comparison, but it, not to the point of that we start hating somebody else but comparing so that we can get better. But that's when we start needing to mentor each other. And that's how much those words of encouragement really help and really go in. So if somebody, this were when I go back to saying consume and share. So we need to consume stuff, but you also have to talk about what your work uh, or the person's work who is inspiring you and give them the kudos where they're due. Um, not healthy comparison, but right, not unhealthy comparison, but comparison for growth. But I do think competition, now I'm super competitive. Like people, like when we play a game, I like to win. But I also know that I am not, and I used to not think this way. I used to really be like, well, I'm not going to share my um, questionnaire that I use with clients. Um, I'm not going to share that. Uh, but now I do. I really share it. And I think, well, I don't think that I'm competing with Doc for the same clients. Like we don't compete. He's a much better illustrator than I could hopefully maybe will be one day, but he, he's just, he has a different um, vibe and feel. And for, for me, I am doing different things. So instead of just looking and being like, Oh, I just want to be, I'm also saying, Hey, here's some things that I can, um, I can reach certain people with the things that I'm doing. So the important thing about this circle is that if all you know is the type of designer that you are, which I think is important to know other web designers if you're a web designer, but if that's the only type of designer you know, we got to branch out because that's how we help each other. So if, I mean, we can't all be Brian White, right? Brian can do anything, and I think it's pretty amazing, um, and I don't really know how he sleeps, but he did just launch Brian White, no. White paint. What was your new URL? Um, on the not URL, the Instagram hashtag. Brian, are you still with us? Anyway, maybe you had to pop off. Um, oh, white fine art on Instagram. So it's like okay, well, he's doing commissions of paintings, which are absolutely beautiful. If you like sunsets, yeah, URL is not yet okay, but it will be. But there. If we don't know anybody else, like if you, if I didn't know any hand letters, if I had somebody said to me, oh, well, we want a custom font or a custom um, lettering for our logo, I would be like, oh, I don't know. It's so much better if I can point them to another trusted person. So we've got to know more people who are doing different things than us. I think it's good that we know other people. Like I turn to Brian a lot when I have questions about web stuff because he's super knowledgeable. But I also think it's good for, you know, if he needed somebody to work for him, that may be what I can offer Brian. Oh, boogers. Okay, so I think um, community, I got to use two bra analogies. Community is like a good bra. It's supportive in all the right ways. Ladies, you know what I mean? Sometimes there are bras that are not so supportive or not doing what I want them to be doing, at least. So, I think we need to build a better pond and we need to build the community and support other people that are not just beavers, right? So then I asked if people traveled to get here because I think some people, you know, if I said everybody right here, I'm sorry, I didn't change the slide now, but if everybody was saying where they are, they really weren't just from Cleveland because that's where the conference was. But there were people of, um, there were people from California, Edgar, um, I met a guy named Edgar. There was uh, DC, Steph was there from DC, Florida with the other Steph, um, uh, Washington State, Vancouver, Washington, near Portland, where Dustin was from, um, Alabama, there was um, New Jersey, right? All the peeps from New Jersey. There were so many people from all over. And to be honest, I think there was half from Cleveland and half from other places. And I think most of the Clevelanders didn't realize how many people were, were from out of the place, but it really felt 
so like you could go up and talk to anybody, which I love. It was very, it had, uh, I got to have lunch with um, people that I wouldn't have gotten to have lunch with that I didn't know any of them. And I just asked if I could have lunch with them. And then other times it would be a big, bigger lunch, right? Um, oh, that's awesome, Carly. She said, I was really envious of another artist who lives near me. I was shocked when he invited me to meet up out of the blue. I realized that this amazing guy was just another person and a really awesome one at that. And it was Chris Reiniak. That's a cool last name. Um, so, but most people raise their hand for this. Did you come to build relationships? I mean, think about why, we're, why we are here right now. Jed and Will know each other. Um, Kim is encouraging Carly, and they've never met. So these are things that, but I've had a meal with both of you, so we're connected. So I feel like we need to be there. And building relationships doesn't just have to be um, at a conference. We can also do some of this online. So I had the extrovert stand up. If you're an extrovert, say, type in something. Okay, Steph stands. So like one third of the room stood up and it was mostly people in the front. It was just kind of funny. Could be that the people in the back just were like, oh, I'm not going to stand up. But I, it was really very interesting that um, I wanted the extroverts to stand up so that the introverts could see and so that the extroverts could look around and see who was sitting down. Because I think we are called as extroverts, I'm an extrovert, to reach out to other people because I don't know if they would necessarily reach out. So after, I, I think it was um, Sunday around lunchtime is when Carly and I um, kind of ran into each other. And we started talking and they were all leaving. So I was like, do you just want to go to lunch with us? And she did. And it was great. And so then um, another guy who had asked me a question during, um, during the talk, um, somebody was calling me, asked, um, he started talking to me. I started talking to him actually on my way out. And I was like, why don't you just go with us? And, and he did. And I was thankful that he didn't have plans. And I mean, we would have off anybody else could have come. Right. But sometimes you just need to ask. And I feel like, um, it's just really important. It's an important part for us because other people just don't feel like that in the beginning. So here are the takeaways. Share your work often on social media. And you have to share, but you also have to consume, right? And, and then comment um, before, more than just beautiful comment, um, showing that you know uh, what you're talking about, talk about colors or line weight or something that you really like about that instead of, I mean, I'm terrible at this. I usually am like beautiful, but this next year I'm going to be much better at this. But if you don't share your work, I remember one time I had somebody on and they were like, Oh, I didn't know you were a designer. And I'm like, man, that's a trouble. I'm, if I'm can't, if I'm not, um, expressing that I'm also a designer here, maybe that's, this is part of my problem. Um, and it is. So Jed, me and you can keep each other accountable on that. So I also think you need to be present on the front porch. So again, comment on other people's. Um, and then when people comment on yours, comment back. Like make sure you really reach out to people who are reaching out to you. And then what's to stop you from saying, hey, let's spend lunch together on a Friday and do a Skype lunch or something. And I think we need to rally around the people who are struggling. This is what I felt like um, both Lenny and I reached out to Jason when he said he was considering leaving the industry. And I really, really was worried about that. And I feel like there comes a time sometime in people's thirties where they either get burned out and they don't have the rally. They don't have the cheerleaders. They don't have the champions. And because of that, um, they get lost and they leave the industry. And I think that's really sad. So more, some couple more was, and I really should have add, added this when I thought about this on the way to work today, be empathetic and learn to be empathetic. So be encouraging and be positive and keep growing. I think that the keep growing thing I know is a beaver trait. So we just need to, when you feel stagnating or stagnant, then that's when you really need to, try something else new or something, right? Burnout is real. Yes, Steph, totally. So I want you to go and be the beaver. 
So I really liked this little guy. Anyway, thank you. So if you want to follow my illustrations, I didn't get to say this because they were rushing me off the stage, but you can follow it on Pound the Friendlies. That's my Diane's. I pretty much have nobody else is posting on that. I guess I could totally ruin it and everybody could start posting on that too, and then it wouldn't just be mine. But that one is just kind of my illustration. So Pound the Friendlies is mine. Okay. And now we'll go back to the stop screen share. Sure, absolutely. I can share it. I will put it um on, on my thing. I kind of feel like I need to take my friend's kids out of there. But then <laughs> the did you travel? But um anyway, I do think the be the beaver. I did say during the thing that was a people laughed at, somebody asked me a question and I said I don't want to retire. I know I had talked to Bill who is over Go Media. He's the president or CEO or whatever. And um, thanks, Steph. Um, I said, I just want to die. I don't want to um, retire. And I, I really believe that. Like that was completely honest, but I guess it was really funny. Um, yeah, I don't want to retire, just die. So anyway, and there that one's from Ace. Uh, snakes and Aces, and then that's Kim Panella. This is one of my favorite, Blake Stevenson. Uh, roller skates and jet jetpacks and roller skates, I think. So, um, Jason, I said I didn't want to retire. I that I don't look forward. That's really a scary thing to me. That feels like um, John will say to me, "Oh, well, if you, um, yeah, I don't want to be a chair. <laughs> me neither, Ann. Um, but I do want to be a designer forever and I do want to be just like Anne's a letterer, but she doesn't have a lot of time to letter. I don't think she wants to ever retire from that, you know? It's okay, Jason. You got a lot going on. So, um, me too, Anne. She says, I do want to do design forever. So, excuse me, man, I am burping up a storm. So, just so you know, you can always follow me at Design Recharge, and you can um, follow the YouTube channel, and I wrote this down, but I can't remember, but I think it's like um, youtube.com slash C slash Design Recharge, I believe. Um, that might not be it, though, but anyway, you can always send me an email. I'd love for you to comment or give me a rating. I don't care even if it's a bad rating on um, iTunes. I mean, I care, actually. But it's okay. Like, I'll take it as feedback, and I'll try to improve. So um, that would be the greatest way. Share an episode or share it on YouTube. Share it from iTunes. Rate it. Give me a comment. I'd love to see more comments and, and get, be able to get back with you. Um, so Jason says... Um, I want to get rich and draw the rest of my life and not have to worry about clients or a job. That'd be great. Yeah, that's what I like to photograph expensive cars and talk to their owners, Jed says. But I really think, to be honest, it's we are each other's family and we have to act like family and we have to encourage each other. And we also have to, in smaller groups, I think mastermind groups are really good for really connecting. So I had said, a few weeks ago, I said, well, maybe I'll charge something. Now I feel like I'm just going to start setting some up. So if you want to be part of a mastermind group, and I'm thinking like four people, you can send me an email with the things that are important to you. So if faith is important, maybe I could put you some with some other people who um, believe similar things as you. If money is really important or growing your business or where you are, like getting learning how to get clients or, or finding a job. Those are things that um, those are things that I could try to put together. I won't be helping you with those necessarily being in there, but I think those are things I need to know. So send me an email to Diane at rechargingyou.com and it's Diane D I A N E. And so anyway, um, and now my husband's here and texting me. 
I think he always forgets that I do this. And oh my goodness, I went super over. So I will sign off. So give me a rating on iTunes or on YouTube. Subscribe. Thank you for being my friends and my family and my community. And you have no idea how much you mean to me. And I'm so thankful that I got to hang out in, in person with some of you this weekend. Um, I think Heather Sakai is uh, amazing. And to put on WMC Fest, it was amazing. I love that venue. Um, it was awesome. So get together and don't forget next week and, because it'll be um, – Joseph is going to be talking about – Joseph Carter Brown, who's here still, is going to be talking about fear and how that can hold us back. But he's really – he's been on before. Um, and – Hopefully it'll be really encouraging for you guys. So I, I'm sorry we went over. I forgot, I guess. Didn't, couldn't see it. Thank you um, for being so encouraging to me. And I hope you have a great day.